A recent TD Economics report says Ontario could benefit from more public-private partnerships on big construction projects. Critics say these partnerships are expensive and end up costing citizens even more. Joining us now for their P3 Perspectives, Mark Romoff. He's president and CEO of the Canadian Council for Public-Private Partnerships. Enid Slack, director of the Institute on Municipal Finance and Governance at the Monk School of Global Affairs at University of Toronto. Toby Sanger, economist with CUPE, the Canadian Union of Public Employees, and Karen Stintz, former Toronto City Councillor and Chair of the Toronto Transit Commission. Great to have everybody here to follow up on our Maddie Simiatiki discussion here because we barely touched on P3s there and I think we need to know more about them. So, Mark, your handy dandy definition of what they actually are, please. So, Steve, public private partnerships or P3s are simply the governments uh, working with companies uh, on uh, building infrastructure, roads, highways, um, detention centers, prisons, um, all that kind of infrastructure, as well as the delivery of public services. And today, Canada has 220 partnerships across the country, P3s, and um, we are known internationally as very best in class when it comes to this model. And who's in charge of them? They're uh, organized by government, so it's government who in fact enters into these agreements with the private sector. And the unique feature of P3s is that governments turn to the private sector to have them design, build, arrange for alternative financing, and maintain these assets over the period of maybe 30, 35 years. And, and in some cases... manage the project all the way through it absolutely. until it's done. And in some cases operate it as well. Okay. Toby, would you agree with that definition? I, I, that's quite a broad definition of what a P3 is. I think that the operational definition right now, and I think Mark would agree, is one that involves private finance right now. Because governments always contract with the private sector for design and build. I mean, we don't have government... Uh, uh, pu public sector workers building things. So, so the real operational definition right now is the private finance and the private sector uh, and the government it, in effect borrowing money from the private sector uh, over long term for these projects. And I think Mark would agree on that. So just so I'm clear, as opposed to the government providing the money to build these projects under P3s, the private company that's building them goes to the marketplace to get that money to do it. Is that usually, the essential it's a difference? usually it's a consortium of, an, um, of the financiers, right. the, 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 the private companies, and usually they're established in what would be called a, what, what, a, a, a special purpose vehicle, a separate company that, uh, that operates each okay. And it's a portion of the finance. Governments can also uh, make a contribution to the overall capital needs of the project and then turn to the private sector to provide um, a portion of, of that financing, either through equity or uh, through debt. Understood. Karen, in your experience of looking at these things, what projects make for good candidates for P3s? Well, typically the best projects for P3s are things like a courthouse or a building, a standalone building. Those lend themselves to uh, private financing because they tend to be not very risky to build. You, the private sector can finance it. They know that they're not going to run into construction delays. The types of projects that aren't as suitable for a P3 are ones that I think transit projects, very complicated transit projects because you've got government sign-offs, you've got utilities that you need to relocate, you've got the public that needs to be consulted, and there's lots of areas within that project that could cause for delays, and delays mean more money, and that means risk, and that means expense. Hmm. And so I think that there are certain projects that are very, very well suitable for a P3, but others less so. How do you see it, Enid, in terms of what's good and what's not good for P3 possibilities? Well, I think we should be clear here that this is not a new revenue source for municipalities. This is not new money. It's just a new financing tool. So instead of the municipality borrowing the money, the private sector is borrowing the money. But the private sector has to be paid back. So it's not like new money for a municipality. Um, what it is is a transfer of risk uh, to the private sector for things like cost overruns and time delays. As a taxpayer, don't you want that? Yes, I, I think um, you know on the on the expenditure side of the budget, there is the potential uh, to reduce costs. Uh, but as I'm saying, it's not new revenues. And I say potential because every every public private partnership is different. Each arrangement is different. Some work better than others. There's a potential for cost savings. It doesn't always happen. All right. As you look at the possibility, though, of cost overruns, which frankly is seems to be a daily occurrence with many big projects these days. Would you rather not have the private sector bearing those cost overruns than the public sector? 
Yeah, um, you. Well, 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 I, well, I think that there had been a history of, of, of what might be uh, considered uh, some optimism in, in the public sector. I don't think that that is, is so much the case anymore. Well, uh, it's not the case anymore. That, 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 there was, uh, that there was a large sense of, uh, of optimism. You do oh. see some uh, cost overruns, but I, but, but I think that they've become uh, uh, more, more accurate at, uh, and, and less optimistic. At, uh, at, uh, at calculating at calculating the cost, um, uh, Enid brought up the issue of well, you brought up the issue of, uh, of, of risk transfer, mm -hmm. and and this is what gets to the nub of the Auditor General's report. The Auditor General uh, came out with a report in November saying that that the uh, that the P3s at Infrastructure Ontario, that's the Ontario P3 agency, uh, operated. Uh, that's the Ontario P3 agency, that they cost $8 billion more than if they were publicly financed mm -hmm. and, 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 and... Because the cost of borrowing money is higher if the because, private sector because, does it than if government does exactly, it. Exactly, because, because, because the cost of borrowing money is about twice okay. that. Mark, in, what in about that sector. issue? Is that a fair point? Well, I think uh, you have to understand actually what the Auditor General said. What she said in her report was that if governments could deliver projects on time and on budget, then they would have paid eight billion dollars less. But they never the reality is uh, <laughs> the track record of governments is pretty uneven around this and there are lots of classic examples, especially here in Toronto. You can start with the Spadina extension. We you just with, with Maddie, Union. in the discussion with Maddie, we went through eight of them. They're, right. all, they're all practically all transit projects that are terrible. Way over budget, yeah. way behind schedule. Yeah. And at the same time though, look at the Union Pearson Express. That will open on time it's being delivered on budget, and it will be ready in time for the Pan Am Games. It's a great project. It's a P3, and in fact is, is in a sense, a very classic example of how you can do it right. I debate a little bit with Karen, because if you've had a chance to be in Vancouver, the Canada Line at the airport, which is the uh, equivalent of the Union Pearson Express, gets you from the airport to downtown Vancouver. That is probably Canada's best example of a public-private partnership where the private consortium designed it, built it, arranged for the financing, they're maintaining it and operating it, and they saved the government of British Columbia $90 million, and that project continues to be a success. Mm -hmm. Karen? Well, the Canada Line is unique, there's, a, and you, there's no comparable transit project in Toronto. And I mean, the other reality is, look, the private sector wants to make money, right? And so if they're going to take on a risky project, they're going to price you accordingly. And so these, these you don't, have public-private partnerships to save money, you, d you have public-private partnerships to deliver your projects on time. So fundamentally, if you believe that the government should not be in the business of project managing these projects, then you would go to the private sector. And also to Eden's, Eden's point, sorry, <laughs> thank you, <laughs> that y these projects, they are funded by the government. They are financed by the private sector, but they are funded by the government. So the government either has, makes the money available up front to build it, or they make it available over a period of time. And if it's better for the government to, to spread it out over a period of time, then it might make sense to go to the private sector to say, could you finance this for me? We'll pay you back over a period of time. But by and large, these projects aren't necessarily cheaper. They do get delivered on time. And if they're risky projects, they're going to be much more expensive. Let's play a little soundbite here, because one of the reasons we're talking about this tonight is because uh, the heavens fell in when the mayor of Toronto announced that the Spadina extension, which was the westernmost of the two sort of north-south subway lines, Loop in Toronto, is way over budget and way behind schedule. Mr. Director, roll it please. Today, we're talking about the York Spadina subway, but the fact is over the years, we have lurched from one fiasco to another, costing taxpayers millions of dollars, tens of millions of dollars, and just as important, delaying the day we get desperately needed transit into service to move people. Suffice it to say, alongside the people of Toronto, I am furious that this happens over and over again on the city's watch. Okay, I have to go first to the former chair of yes. the TTC here who <laughs> may have had a little bit of this yeah, happen you know, on and, her and watch. What happened here? Well, you know, again, I, it's been a while since I've been the chair of the TTC, mm -hmm. but while I was there, we knew this project was going to be over budget because we knew we had a contractor that wasn't delivering. And he was building a, a critical station right in the middle of the line. And so it was... It, it, and it's a challenge because we tried to negotiate with a contractor, they stopped work, they wanted us to pay them more, but they actually bid through a process and were awarded the project because they bid the low bid, and then they told us they couldn't do the work for what they bid. So hmm. it was, it was, it's a very... Um, and, and, and this, just to be clear, was not a P3. This was not a P3, no. This is the, the TTC contracting out 
directly? To, yes, to the private sector to build the station. And I mean, the tunnels were built on time, the other stations were built on time, we had one station that was not. And, and it was, it, there's no question that the public, we didn't manage public expectations very well on it, and they feel, and rightly feel, as if billions of dollars have been wasted. And again, it, um, but the, having a public-private partnership do this project wouldn't have helped. You don't, Mark, would it have helped if it were a P3 instead of the TTC directly managing it? I think so, because a public-private partnership is an agreement between governments and the private sector. It's a fixed price contract with well-articulated outcomes and expectations over the course of the project. And the private sector, as a team, a consortium that's bidding this project, is in fact making sure they integrate the design uh, with the construction, with the financing uh, from external sources, along with the maintenance. So yeah. you, if you have a bad design, uh, the construction guy can't say, I can't build that, the design doesn't work for me, because they are a team. And so if, in fact, there is a cost overrun because of design changes or construction schedules, the nature of this arrangement requires that it's the private sector companies as a team that uh, actually absorb the cost, any cost overrun. Karen Well, if you have a bad contractor, you have a bad contractor. And the private sector is only going to absorb the cost until they don't make a profit. But private, the private sector does not do this as a volunteer opportunity or for free. And so they're only going to do it if they get paid to do it. And as soon as they stop getting their money in their return, because they ever, everyone has shareholders, so as soon as the private sector stops getting their return, they will go back to their government funder and say, we need more money. Ian, is there any reason to believe that this project would not be so egregiously over budget and behind schedule if it had been a P3, a private-public partnership, from the beginning, as opposed to the way well, it went? you know, it depends on the actual agreement that is struck. Uh, you know, we, we, wouldn't, we don't know what that would have been like. Uh, Mark's right, when you combine design, build, uh, operate, finance, you know, there's some efficiencies that you can have when you're doing all those things together. Potentially that could happen. Uh, you can put the risk of cost overruns and time delays on the private sector if you structure the contract in a way that does that, but you're going to pay for that. I mean, if, if the private sector is going to bear those risks, they want some return for that. But at least it and might so, get done on time and on budget. Well, it might. Again, it depends on the way the agreement is struck and, and how the risks are shared and who's paying for those risks. So Karen's absolutely right. I'm, uh, uh, the, the Auditor General report uh, I, I identified what, what I've seen in, in, in a number of the P3 uh, project, in a number of the P3 business cases, and that is that there is absolutely no evidence for the risk transfer. Absolutely no evidence. All of the P3s in Ontario are assumed on the basis that massive amounts of, of risk was transferred to the private sector, but, they have, but there's not a shred of evidence for that. Now, uh, um, you did talked about it being on time and on budget, uh, and, um, and, and the private sector bearing that, that risk. You can have a, public, a, a, a traditional pu public procurement that's a fixed price contract in that way, a construction manager well, what, risk. What about a case like the Spadina like one where the contractor's bad and doesn't fulfill their end of the bargain? Well, well that can be a case, but also, as Karen said, uh, uh, with a P3, often, uh, the, the, in a P3, generally the private sector only puts up about 10% of the, of, the, of the cost of it in equity. They can always walk away. That's what happened in, 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 in London, in, in the UK. With the Metronet, they, they went bankrupt, they walked away. In Ottawa, there are a number of P3s there for, for, for uh, arenas. Uh, within in, in three years into the, into the project, um, these are profitable uh, corporations. They said, it's not enough money, we want more so, money. Toby, so, Toby, is so, it your so view that we should never do these again? Uh, it, it's my view that they should be transparent. There's absolutely no transparency. You, you try and find the business cases and the, and, and the rationalizations for this. They're not available. That's why we have to rely on the, on the Auditor okay, that's, General. That's not my answer, though. My, my, my question was, are you saying I, we should never do these again? I would say that none of them have been, none of them are justified on the basis of, of, of what we've, of, on the basis of what we've seen. Karen, so is, that a, is that a fair conclusion? I would disagree with you somewhat, only in that if the government doesn't have the money right now up front to do the construction project and wants to borrow over time or has a revenue stream over time, then private financing might make some sense. But there's certainly risky projects and less risky projects, and my, I would always argue that the less risky projects are better options for our public-private partnership. You've just put your finger, actually, on one of the reasons governments may like these things, and we haven't touched on it yet, which is, Mark, if you do this, if you do a P3, instead of government being in charge of managing the project itself, the money's technically not on the government's books that year, right? 
No, it's on the government's books from the start. So there's no off-book The whole accounting. cost of the whole project? No, there's no, no off-book no, accounting. No, it's not. There is no off-book accounting with respect to P3. That's not, no, that's that's not my understanding. The, the capital costs are, right. but not the long-term liabilities. The long-term liabilities associated with the P3s, uh, associated with P3s in Ontario, uh, amount to tens of billions of dollars, and those are not all reflected on the government's books. Well, Ian, it helps us out because my, my, I guess the point I'm trying to make is if you're a government trying to balance yeah. the books and you don't have to show this liability year in, that helps you if you're doing a P3. Well, the, the, but the government, as I said earlier, has to pay back that money to the private sector. So it, it's there. Years down the so, road. So, you know, municipalities in Canada are allowed to borrow money to meet capital expenditures. Mm -hmm. There are some restrictions on how much they can borrow, uh, but most of them are well below those borrowing limits. They could actually borrow more and more cheaply than the private sector. They often choose not to. They often don't like to put that borrowing on the books. Um, and it's a very visible debt. But you know, I think that the b bigger question here, Steve, is how are cities going to pay for the infrastructure we need? What, what would you estimate the, the need to be right now? Well, you know, there's so many numbers floating around. I mean, the, the latest number we have is an old number from 2008 from the Federation of Canadian Municipalities that says the infrastructure deficit is $123 billion. Is that nationwide? That's nationwide and that's on the rise. Uh, we looked at Toronto recently at our institute, and their state of good repair budget uh, for this year is over $2 billion. So that is just maintaining the existing infrastructure that they have to keep it in good repair is $2 billion. That has nothing to do with the new infrastructure they need uh, to, to finance growth. So do you think P3s are a viable option for dealing with that infrastructure backlog? Well, it, it's a financing tool. It's not a revenue tool. It can be part of the toolkit. But you know, municipalities can borrow, they can raise property taxes, they have user fees, they can charge developers development charges to pay the growth related uh, costs associated, the capital costs associated with new development. So it's one part of a big package okay. of tools but that I'm, they need to I'm asking to here, Karen, yes. in part so, because we got a Scarborough subway in Toronto that is allegedly going to be built over the next decade. Yeah. Should, should, no. should we do a P3 process to get uh, that no, built? Absolutely not. No. But if you're building a new hospital or you're, you're building a new long-term care facility or you're building a new school, Absolutely, 100% public-private partnerships are the way to go. Why not the because, Scarborough subway? Because you don't have, well, the Scarborough subway, it, because it's, it's an extension of an existing asset, so it's harder to finance that. There's also, there's more risk involved in utility locates and building a complicated piece of infrastructure. But, you know, the, the TDSB, by their own admission, they don't, they don't build schools. There's no capacity, there's no competency to build schools. Now, you could argue that the TTC doesn't have any capacity to build or competency in building projects, but they actually do. And they've just had a situation that was unfortunate. But the Ministry of Health, they don't build hospitals. The public-private se sector partnership is very, very appropriate for that. Scarborough Subway? Absolutely. And I think, quite frankly, um, the bigger the risk, the more uh, uh, reason to, in fact, go ahead with a P3, because it's exactly that risk that is uh, allocated to the private sector, who has the capability to, in fact, deliver on that project. Again, I mentioned earlier that there are 220 projects across Canada. Mm -hmm. We recently commissioned an independent study of P3s in Canada over the past decade, and the economic impact is quite remarkable. Over 290,000 direct jobs created, a contribution to Canada's GDP, direct GDP, more than $25 billion, savings to government, $9.9 .9 billion. Well, hang on, let me, let me uh, hang yeah. on, hang yeah. on. I want to follow up on that one there. Yeah. Uh, Madam Former Chair of the TTC, uh, latest figure for building the Scarborough subway, how much? 1.8 billion. 1.8 billion? Yeah. So how much of a premium does the private sector want on that in order to build it under a P3? Well, that will be what the negotiation and the competitive process Ballpark. determines. Ballpark. Well, Can't we say, because every one of these projects is different. There's, and the advantage But there's no question that, that they'll, they'll say, oh, for $3 billion, we will build your subway on time and on budget for $3 billion. Yeah. <laughs> I would have, I, exactly. uh, a three-stop subway. Right, because there is no so. way. Because yeah. there is no way they're going to take risk around utilities, around um, problems that, c that come up, uh, delays, government approvals, like all of those things have risk. And, well, and sure. the public sector, but, that's the whole but the private sector it, prices that risk. Look at the right L LRT in Ottawa. That is a public-private partnership. It has exactly the same features. No, it doesn't. And in fact, no, those doesn't. risks are transferred to the private sector. They same features those as what? Risks. Same features as Scarborough Not extending Subway? a subway. Well, it's a light no. rail transit system. They're not, they're not remotely comparable, though. 
But the, these are big projects <laughs> in excess of a billion dollars. Mm -hmm. They are transit projects. They share the same kinds of features. No, they don't. They have the same, <laughs> similar <laughs> risks, similar risks, <laughs> and the fact that you have a competitive bidding process, you get these various consortia to bid competitively that brings the price down and drives up innovation. And that's exactly the outcome we've had time and time again across Canada okay, on our P3s. Okay, okay, I want to get, get, get to a number of, uh, of points here. First of all, I don't think any P3s in Canada have been justified in terms of value for money. So, so I think the that hospitals? they're a bad deal. No, and I'll talk a little bit more, but I'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, secondly, the risk always, it, it always remains with the public sector. It, we all, the, the public sector always pays for it, always responsible for delivering the service. The private consortiums can walk away uh, and just leave their equity, which is usually about 10% of the project. And meanwhile, the assumptions for transferring risk are about 50%. Now getting to hospitals, about half of the value of P3s in Ontario have been hospitals. Uh, I, I'm just gonna use a, a, a specific example here. North Bay, a regional hospital. Original cost estimate was 200 million. Then I uh, got it got proposed as a P3. The capital cost was 400 million. That's the happened actual, in Sudbury and Thunder Bay too. That happens yeah, everywhere. Yeah. Uh, the total amount that they're going to pay for that contract over the 30 years is a billion dollars. And if that was publicly financed, the actual cost for it, the actual interest cost for it would have been 200 million dollars less. That's a, that's a significant amount. Over 30 years, that means $7 million more in, in, in private financing costs than if it was publicly done. Now, what's happened, that was opened up less than five years ago. Already we're having, uh, already they've laid off uh, 100 frontline staff. They've closed um, uh, 23 beds. They're about That's to close not related to the P3 beds. process. Well, they're pay if they're paying, it, uh, well, I, yes, it is. If they're paying, if they're paying $7 million more dollars per year in financing costs, Yes, it is. Okay, what about, what, 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 what about the, the William, What about the William Mosler Hospital in Brampton? Uh, the Auditor General, we went to court to try and get information on that because they weren't open about it. When the Auditor General looked at it, they, they said that it cost $200 million more as a P3 than if it was publicly financed. Here's the $200 question. $200 million if, more. Was it worth it to the people who eventually get their health care services there because eventually even if it was $200 million more, it got done on time and probably better than had the province of Ontario managed the case itself because they seem to be doing a bad job at managing a lot of things these days. Is that possible? No, 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 no. I would, not say, possible. I, would, I would say I would say that they're doing a bad job. I mean, look at the gas plants. That was a billion dollar scandal. That walked and talked and looked well, like a Well, that's a different free. case no, entirely. No, no, it was well, like, it was like, it was like, no. Okay, hang on, Karen, think, Karen, yeah. hang on totally. I think Karen. we can all yeah. agree on a good example of a P3 project is the Confederation Bridge. That is a good example because it was financed. This is Prince Edward Island? Prince Edward Island. Oh, okay. It was uh, financed by the private sector. They charge a toll for people to use it, which goes back to pay back the private sector. So there's minimum government funding that was required up front and actually minimum on the long term because there's a, re a dedicated revenue stream to pay back the financing. Well, same as the 407 here and in Ontario. Same as the 407. So those are the kind of projects I think we all would agree make sense. Dedicated revenue stream, paying off the financing, hold the p private sector accountable for the financing and the delivery. And I wouldn't agree on that. I mean, the, the, the federal auditor general <laughs> said that, 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 the, uh, that, that it costs $35 million more for, for the P3 and the Confederation Bridge on that. Highway 407, I think the Ontario government has decided that that was a bad deal in that way. Uh, 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 the fees are higher, but, but Karen did identify one thing, and that is that there's some demand risk involved in, with, with, those, with those projects. Most, most P3s in, in, in Canada don't have that demand risk, that revenue risk. So, so, so there's very little risk transfer. Now, you said that, that with, with, with respect to the William Osler Hospital, mm -hmm. that people are happier because they have, have a hospital when they didn't before. Well, what's happening now is that services are being cut, just as it just as ha is happening in the UK, because of the ballooning costs of, uh, of these P3 payments. So they're late, um, at the North Bay Hospital, less than five years. They're already laying off staff. 100 Hundred staff, many of those frontline, they're closing beds. We thought we're, we're being concerned about P3s because we thought this would eventually happen. Okay, let the, me ask the, you the, this. The okay, in, in, can you now, draw a direct right line? Now. Okay, Toby, hang on. can you draw a direct line between the premium you have to pay to do it as a P3 because the private sector is assuming more of the risk, to nurses getting laid off 
today because the project cost more. Can you actually make that direct connection in your view? I, I, I don't know the answer to that. I, you know, I, I think mm -hmm. what we're hearing here is, is you know, P3s that have worked, P3s that haven't worked. Mm -hmm. It really comes down to what I said at the beginning. It really depends on the agreement that, that you strike and who's bearing the risks and how you're pricing those risks. So they are not in and of themselves evil. They're not evil or they're not great. They, they're, they, are, uh, they have potential uh, to lower the cost to, to a municipality if the agreements are struck, you know, in, in the right way. Um, and that we have, you know, that the municipalities have done a cost benefit analysis ahead of time. They know what the costs are going to be to them. They know what the benefits are. They've priced the risks. They've written a good agreement. They can work. But, you know, you're hearing cases that did and cases that didn't. Mark, frankly, I think, uh, Toby, your comments are unsubstantiated. I think the next show you want to have is with the CEOs of Sioux Area Hospital, Women's College Hospital, Bridgepoint, pick three or four others because there are many hospitals in Ontario, mm -hmm. many hospitals in Ontario that have gone ahead as P3s and what they'll say in the Sioux is that if it wouldn't have been for the government working with the public, the private sector, they never would have had that hospital built. And that's another feature of the P3 that? approach. Why not? Why would that hospital because, not have happened had it not been a P3? Because governments will not go ahead with it if they have to assume the full financial risk and also take on all the responsibility for that project. So in the case of the Sioux Area Hospital, it's a classic where it, it only went ahead because the government decided to go ahead with an AFP or a P3. AFP, as you know, was the way Alternative it's, financing it's, program. The, is, is the, the, the reasons why, the, the reasons why, they, the, 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 the reasons why Mark would say that that's happening is because, unfortunately, upper levels of government, the federal government uh, and provincial governments are only approving financing and, and providing that financing as, as P3s because they want to keep a lot of that, that, a lot of that debt off the books. They don't and want to they, borrow and, the money. And, 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 so, and, right. and, so and you're they right. don't these want things, to borrow the money. These things yeah. are being built uh, that might not have been uh, because the government doesn't have to borrow the money. And if they have to wait till their financial house is, in, is, is mm -hmm. uh, more solid, then, then there's a, a time delay. But it's together, creating together. massive liabilities in the future. And the real problem is that they're also, I mean, federal and provincial governments can issue more debt. We're going to have more debt. Ontario will have, um, you know, tens more uh, uh, billion dollars of debt than they, than they have because of P3s. But they're also forcing, the real problem is that they're also forcing other levels of government uh, municipalities to engage in P3s in that way. And those are, those are levels of government that, that, that cannot, cannot easily okay, issue Toby, more Okay, Toby, let me try this with you. You, you. you would acknowledge there are some things the public sector does well and does better than the private sector. You might even say this television station is an example of that. You might say that. <laughs> would you acknowledge there are some things the private sector does better than the public sector? Uh, perhaps there are some things. I mean, they, I can name I one. Mean, I mean, <laughs> name one. Well, they can go bankrupt. Uh, <laughs> Seriously. Seriously. <laughs> name one. The, the, the name, government name one can. thing you're prepared to acknowledge that the private sector actually does better when it comes to projects. Well, they, well, they, can, they, 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 they build infrastructure. The government doesn't build infrastructure. Absolutely. But, 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 but to borrow money from the private, from the private sector at twice the rate that, 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 that the public sector can that's, borrow that's at not true. makes no sense. Makes absolutely no sense. It's not sense. twice the rate? It is it not is. twice the rate. It's fundamentally, it um, that's not true. And furthermore, uh, rates are going down as well. So you're going to find that, that rates between what the private sector can get money at and the public sector are getting very close now. Wow. So that argument, again, is an argument but of But again, it all depends story. on how risky the project is. So if you look at the consortium that's looking now to build the Edmonton Crosstown, mm -hmm. that's a big consortium. Just for the that's, people living outside Toronto, explain what that is. That's the uh, LRT that's going to go through the center of the city. So that's a very, very risky project. How long is that project? The total it's kilometers? 20 kilometers. 20 10, kilometers. And 10 kilometers is underground. And I right. think they're building seven stations. And it's they're, going to take how long? It's going to, well, they're saying 19, 2019. I, I don't think that's possible, but we'll see. Be longer than that, probably. Probably. That is an extremely. Maybe not. <laughs> if it's a P3, it's maybe It's an extremely not. risky project. Is it a P3? No, it's not a P3. It is a P3. It's it's part of it. So the tunnel's it. been built, but again, the, the, the stations have been separated out from the tunnel. So it's a very complicated, very risky project. Which is There's why also it's being procured as a public No, the reason it's being procured as a public private partnership is because the government doesn't have the money in its books right now to do it. So they're amortizing this project over 30 years but, and they're using a consortium to give them the money. But that's why you get a mortgage money. when you buy a house, right? I'm so not, why I want to buy a house and I can't afford afford to pay for I'm that saying, right up but front, I'm, I'm then not I saying, have a mortgage. Just don't assume that it's going to be a better, well-managed project because the public, private sector is financing it. 
It's not about financing. It's wait. not about financing. In this, this case, is a it procure- is solely about financing. But it's when you solely talk about financing. It's a procurement approach. It's not a financing approach. And I would debate Ian with you. It's not a financing tool. It's a way in which you procure. And there are two ways to do it. You can do it as a P3, partnership with the private sector along the lines we described, or you can do it in a more traditional way, which is a design, bid, build approach. And all we're saying is that Time and time again, we have seen in Canada that when we've moved ahead with that project procured as a public-private partnership, we've had results that are very startling, and they are on time, on budget, cheaper, okay. and with... Let me, uh, let me just go with Karen here for a second, because yeah. uh, I want to understand this. Thing. It's right outside our station, That's this thing. It's going to go right past the station here. Yeah. You're saying part of it is a P3, and part of it has been directly... Yes. Contracted and managed by the TTC. That's, well, that's no, 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 by Metrolinx. No? Not, oh, by not Metrolinx. By, by, Sorry. Yeah. So the tunnel was built entirely outside of any P3 model. The stations okay. have been bundled into a, a consortium, and again, it's very, very expensive, upward of a billion dollars. There's not a lot of private companies that have a billion dollars mm-hmm. on hand to go build stations to get paid back over a period of 30 years. So it's, it is, it, the, the, the entire endeavor, endeavor is very risky just because of the, the numbers that we're talking about and the length of the, the line and of all the inherent things that can go wrong, here's it the, is a very, very risky project. Here's and the follow-up and question. the private sector has priced it accordingly. Here's the follow-up yes, question. Is there any reason to believe the part that is covered by the P3, that the private sector is financing, managing, building, etc., will come in any better on time and any better on budget well, than the part that Metrolinx is in charge of? But again, when they say, when the private sector sets a budget, they'll set a budget for $2 billion to build these stations. And they'll probably come in at $2 billion. But, but they've put a cushion in there. Absolutely they have. It, it, the, exactly the same thing happens if you're building a house. You can do a fixed price right. contract for that. You're going you're right. to you're you're pay more. But, it, but, but you're, not going to, you're not going to go for higher cost financing. You're going to pay twice the rate. Right now, the, the Ontario government can borrow at less than 3% over 30 years. The private cost of financing, the blended rate is probably at least 6%. Uh, uh, with those so projects. So the question becomes, there, 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 is it worth the premium we're paying to have it done this way? No, no, absolutely so. not. Uh, I, I, another thing that the Auditor General brought up is that there's very little competition in the P3, in the P3 industry. Five firms got 80% of the mm-hmm. contracts. There's, uh, there's bias. A, a, another big problem with these P3 agencies is that they're all charged with promoting P3s and also assessing them. So they're the referees as well as the promoters. Conflict of that interest? Absolute conflict of interest. And there's also, you see that, there are, that, that people in those P3 agencies, there's a bit of a revolving door with, it, with, 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 it, with the private sector. So, so, so there's a real problem there. And I then the ju- other I, big problem i got to jump in. I don't is, have time for the other big yeah. problem because we're plumb out of time. But who knew that discussing the procurement of public works projects could be such an engaging and exciting topic? Yeah. I want okay. to Thank you. I got, Thank you to your <laughs> superior facilitation skills. I've got 20 seconds left. Is there life after politics? There is life after politics, and now? it's a good one. What are you doing now? It's a good one. I'm the executive director of Arts Build Ontario, and you know what we do? We build capital. We help uh, arts facilities build capital projects. All right. We'll be talking. <laughs> there you go. Mark Romoff, it's good of you to join us today from the Thank Canadian you. Council for Public-Private Partnerships. Toby Sanger is with QP. Enid Slack from the Institute on Municipal Governance and Finance at the Monk School, Karen Stintz, former Toronto City Councillor and TTC Chair. Thanks, everybody, for coming into TVO tonight. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at TVO.org.